second phase of the 1500 turn, and the Union player has some decisions to make. Uh, one decision to make is what to do with Van Cleve's division here. Uh, one brigade, uh, Barnes's brigade, uh, and Van Cleve's division is wrecked uh, by the, that's a lost chart issue. Uh, but not, not only wrecked, they're also disorganized and they have low ammo. So not only are they very likely to retreat if they get fired upon in a future turn, but when they fire, they they fire at half strength due to the low ammo. Um, and another issue that Barnes's brigade faces here is the way things currently stand, they're out of command radius. Uh, they're expected to be four leader movement points away from Van Cleve, but Van Cleve can't trace a line outside of an enemy zone of control to Barnes uh, in four movement points or less. Uh, they're Van Cleve uh, or, or, you know, or, or an aide or whatever could not go here because this hex is within the zone of control of Bates's brigade and so the line would have to go something like this one, uh, one to move here two to go into this forest hex this the stream isn't affected so one two three and then four to enter this clear hex but that leaves them one hex short of uh, Barnes's brigade so we will have to move so uh, in this series of games that requires Barnes's brigade to move so that by the end of the movement phase they are back within command radius of Van Cleve. Uh, the other decision to make about Van Cleve is uh, I don't think we want to leave Dick's brigade here because right now uh, they're already lined up against two opposing brigades and uh, if and if Barnes's brigade is going to retreat, there's an additional possibility of Brown's brigade moving south and 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 attacking Dick's, Dick's brigade as well, um, which would just be, you know, horrible odds. Uh, so I think what Van Cleve's division wants to do is to pull pull out Dick's brigade here, uh, and and try to uh, reestablish some some sort of line um, uh, to continue to fight S S S Stewart's division. Now it might also be possible for uh, remember Van Cleve had Van Cleve's orders. They have a divisional goal to defend the. Uh, and I just and I learned something recently that uh, the correct like local pronunciation of the name of this road would be Lafayette, not Lafayette. So, uh, uh, but anyways, Van Cleve's division has an order to defend the Lafayette Road between the Brotherton and the Brock House, uh, uh, but the order does not say defend at all costs. Uh, so I think that gives Van Cleve a little bit of latitude here in how to interpret the order. Uh, and what I've decided to do is I've I've decided to I've decided that uh, Van Cleve will reestablish his line along these three hexes here to essentially protect the left flank of the division. Um, I think the uh, uh, the the real danger for Van Cleve's division is that it gets somehow outflanked on the left here. Um, if I could angle, somehow angle Stewart's attack, sort of, if I can angle Stewart's division sort of more east, like block it from the west, block its progress in the west, and maybe angle Stewart's attack so that it's coming more from the east again, um, that's only to my advantage because then I'm keeping, you know, uh, Union units between uh Stewart's division and my headquarters, uh, and that would contribute to actually, you know, defending the Lafayette Road up to the to the Brotherton uh, house here. Um, 
Now, if I had ordered, now if Van Cleve had divisional gold to defend at all costs, then I think I would probably, you know, wearing my Van Cleve hat here, you know, as a union player, I would probably interpret that as requiring some, perhaps some sort of offensive action on my part, um, maybe bringing up a uh, Beatty's uh, brigade uh, up into the attack and maybe attacking uh, Clayton's brigade here. Now, one, unf I could do that, but I wouldn't be able to allow, wouldn't be able to bring my artillery uh, the artillery connected with uh, Beatty's brigade along with me in that attack. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm, I've decided to, rather than to take offensive action, again, this is, you know, interpreting my orders, is to establish a defensive line here, is that that will allow me to get the two, uh, the two artillery strength points south here to join in the defense. And generally speaking in this series of games, I think this is probably true of a lot of uh, American tactical American Civil War games, you want to try to establish your defense with artillery if you possibly can and, you know, establish a defense, you know, establish a defensive line that allows you to make use of the artillery that you have. Now pulling Van Cle uh, pulling uh, Dick's brigade out of here will require that this one strength point of artillery limber in an enemy zone of control, so it will have to roll on the gun table. Um, and there is a better than 50% chance that that strength point of artillery will be lost in that process. But uh, as you know, as the Union player, I've decided that it's worth that risk in order to try to get a defensive line uh, on these three hexes here. Now, with that in mind, uh, you also may remember that Negley uh, Negley has arrived at the army of the Cumberland headquarters and occupying the same hex as the headquarters and the and the counter depicting Rosencrantz. Um, and so that's going to allow Rosencrantz to issue an in-person order uh, to Negley in this turn. Uh, now the question of course is what do I want to do with Negley? Um, and what I've decided to do is to order Negley's brigade northeast to essentially take over the defense of this portion of the road from Van Cleve's division. Um, now that's not the only way I could bring assistance to Van Cleve. I could send an order to Reynolds to move north to assist. Uh, remember that Wilder's brigade here uh, acts very independently. I don't need, he doesn't need an order from any superior in order to act. So that means that I, as the, you know, functioning as a union player, can just send Wilder anywhere I want to. So another thing I could do is just send Wilder's brigade north uh, to help Van Cleve. But, but of course, then I'd be leaving gaps um, or potential gaps in the line if I did one of those two things. And you know, of course, you know, since I'm playing solo, I know that there's a lot of command delay and confusion with the Confederate Army right now, but uh, I'm not, of course, playing solo, I'm not really allowed to, I don't want to consider that information in making my decision as a Union player. Um, and so I just, I, what makes the most sense to me in this situation is that Rosencrantz, you know, Negley has arrived, so and Rosencrantz perceives, you know, all that all that Rosencrantz really knows right now is that there's an attack uh, to the northeast, and perhaps at least one of the one of the brigades in Van Cleef's division has been routed. So I think it makes the most sense for Rosencrantz, the the army commander, to send Negley's division northeast to to uh, to assist Van Cleef's division. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and uh, th another reason it makes sense is that. Uh, I think it makes sense is that the overall union plan here is to hold the Lafayette Road uh, long enough to so that the 21st Corps and the 20th Corps can move north um, uh, and, and get up to the to the area where the fighting is actually taking place. Um, if I can concentrate my all my you know I as the union player can concentrate all my troops. Um, on this portion of the Lafayette Road, then I might be in a, a position to take offensive action at this time. But uh, right now, I think 
my goal as a, as a union player should continue to be to just hold this road until I can get these two core uh, to where the to where the fighting is. So going to our sequence of play now. So the first thing we're going to do is the first stage is to issue new orders. Uh, so and I've got the I've got the orders I'm going to issue this turn already written out. Uh, the first order I'm going to issue, and remember Rosencrantz has has a, a rating of one, so that means he has 12 command points. So I'm going to issue two, so Rosencrantz is going to issue two orders, each of which costs six. Um, the f first, Rosencrantz is going to issue uh, an in-person order to Negley uh, uh, that says Negley's division should march to the northeast, secure the Lafayette Road north of Reynolds' division, and push the Army of the Cumberland east of the road. Uh, so that's one order. And then the other order Rosencrantz is going to issue, again costing six points, is is to give a new set of orders uh, to Negley's division, uh, sorry, to uh, Van Cleve's division. Um, Van Cleve is the recipient of that order. Uh, and the order is once Negley's division is ready to take over the defense of the Lafayette Road, Van Cleve's division should cede the defense of the Lafayette Road to Negley's division and support Reynolds' division to the south. Um, so once, again, once, so it's a, it's a kind of conditional order. Uh, Negley's going to continue to follow his order to defend the Lafayette, the Lafayette Road until Van Cleve is in, or, sorry, Van Cleve is going to continue to uh, implement his order to defend the Lafayette Road until Negley arrives and then essentially Negley's division at that point or you know what perhaps what's left of it uh, will basically support Reynolds to the south. Um, so so those are the two issues that I've ordered. Um, since the order to Negley's division is an in-person order, we'll roll for acceptance later on in this command phase of the 1500 turn. Um, Rosencrantz's order, new order to Van Cleve will arrive at the 1530 turn because the um, uh, because it, would ta it takes less than 10 liter movement points for an aide to move between the army of the ten the the army of the Cumberland headquarters and Van Cleve here. It's less than 10. Uh, so that means it will take one full turn for the order to get to Van Cleve. So, so we'll or, we'll roll for acceptance in the union phase of the 1530 turn for this for the second order. Uh, core stoppage, core attack stoppage checks. There's none of those to be made. Uh, initiative order determination. Um, I don't think there's any initiative rolls I want to make for any. Union commander uh, delay reduction for, for orders that have already arrived. Uh, we've got two of those. We've got one to the twenty first core. Well, oh, I sorry. We've got one order that's already arrived. The order to the 21st Corps to move north along the Lafayette Road, secure Davis's right flank, and drive the the, the Rebel Army from the Lafayette Road. Um, so, so, so we're going to roll for delay status uh, during this phase, and then the order we issued to the 20th Corps. Uh, to move north on the Lafayette Road to defend the road near the Brock Cabin, uh, that order will arrive this turn, and so we'll roll uh, for um, initial acceptance uh, in the next phase. So for this phase, uh, we're going to roll for uh, for delay status, um, and it's D1, so that means that uh, the if we roll, a, we're going to roll a 1D6. If we roll a 1 or a 2, then the order is accepted. If we roll a 3 through 6, then uh, the order stays in delay status.
So, and when I, and again, when I, ma when I roll a 1d6, I rolled the, the ensemble of dice used for fire combat, but I only pay attention to the blue uh, straggler dice. So we'll do that. We're saying again, the union player is looking for a one or a two here, and they do not get it. So the order continues in de to be in delay. Going back to our sequence of play. Now we're going to roll for new order acceptance uh, for the order to the uh, the 20th core. So we'll go to our acceptance table. And let's also see in our chart, this, is, this was a, I believe, a written complex. Well, I'm just going to verify that. Yeah, it was a written complex with 0 and 1. Um, so we have 0 plus 1 equals 1. Written is a 0. And then a complex is minus 2, so that's a minus 1. So we're on this column here, not a great column. So 0 plus 1, minus 2 is minus 1. OK, so we're rolling, on, we're rolling a, uh, a 2d6 on this column right here. And we rolled a 4. That's d2 status, meaning that on subsequent uh, delay, checks will have to roll, uh, only a one will allow the uh, order to be accepted. So that's uh, very, that's unfortunate for the, uh, um, for the union player. So I'm going to put that in our order chart. And that's the end of the command phase in the in the Union player's half of the 1500 turn. So now we're going to move to movement and close combat. Uh, we're not going to place any straggler markers, so we're at the movement and close combat stage. Um, so the only movement we're going to... Oh, wait. Uh, We didn't do Negley's uh, new order. Glad I caught that. Negley also, um, oh, well, we didn't issue the new orders at all, did we? OK, so there's two new orders to issue. Um, um, so we're on the acceptance table. Uh, neg we'll do Negley first. Oh, we'll, yeah, we'll do the order to Negley first. This is an in-person order. So Negley has a command rating of 1. Uh, so we have Rosencrantz is 1 plus Negley's 1 equals a 2. An in-person makes it a 4. And then a complex is minus 2. So that puts it on this column. So if we roll a 6 on this 2d6 roll, the order will be instantaneously accepted and, and implemented. Um, so let's roll our 2d6. Rolled a 9. That's d1 status. So Negley will have to continue to roll for, uh, for the order to be fully accepted and implemented, uh, but, but a 1 or a 2 So let me make a, a so this is in delay. D one status. And then we're gonna make also make an acceptance roll for the order to, to uh, Van Cleave. So 
so now Van Cleve has a rating of three, so it's going to be Rosencrantz is one plus Van Cleve's three plus um, this is an oral order. Um, I didn't have uh, Rosencrantz doesn't have enough. Uh, uh, command points to issue a, a written order that costs more command points than an oral order. So it has to be a minus one. So one plus three is four, minus one is three, and then a complex order takes it down to a, to a plus one. So we're on this column right here, rolling a 2d6. Roll to four, rolling lots of fours. Uh, so that's D2, again, unfortunate for the Union player, although not as bad as the order getting thrown away entirely. Um, so we'll make one more update to the order chart here. This is... Oh wait, no, this one, this, that order does not, uh, doesn't arrive to 1530, so I'm just going to th throw out that result. That's right, this is not an in-person order. So next turn during the new, the new order, during the, uh, uh, the order arrival uh, phase will will roll on this order. So my apologies. Let me save my results here before I forget. All right. So now we're at the movement and close combat phase. Um, and I already said my goal is to uh, set up a defensive line along these three hexes. So let's make good on that. Um, so. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do, and this is the first time I, I've done this, is I'm going to extend Beatty, the Beatty, Beatty's Brigade to include this hex here. Um, and the way you do that in this game is you, you take um, an extended marker. Uh, that's army specific marker so it, so a U, uh, yeah USA ex extended line marker and then uh, what what you're supposed to do with this is you're supposed to point the arrow in the direction of the of the counter that this counter is an extension of. Um, so the arrow does not indicate, does not say anything about the um, the uh, the facing of the unit. It just, so so if we're playing a physical copy of the game, I would do this. Now one nice thing about Vassal is I can I can actually uh, label this extended marker To indicate the brigade that it's an extension of, so I'm going to enter one three twenty one here, just so that there's no ambiguity. Um, now one, uh, and then I want to put a B. Remember, we're starting with a B fire level here, so I'm going to extend a B worth of st strength and firepower into this hex. So I'm going to put. Um, a B counter right here, and then I'll um, now one one limitation of you know this way of representing it is you don't really have a good way of indicating facing. Uh, for the uh, for an extended line. Um, uh, now, given that I, you know, if I guess if I no one was watching, I would probably use this arrow to indicate the facing, you know, in Vassal, since I'm able to to label the uh, uh, the the extended line marker. Uh, the the physical version of the game doesn't have anything to. That lets you do that. You'd have to make something of your own. Um, I'm just. I'm going to do the same thing I would do if I were playing a physical copy, and just remember what I want the facing to be. And I'll discuss that in a second. Um, the other thing I'm going to do, uh, since I'm able to, is um, I'm going to do another artillery dis 
uh, detachment to put a strength point of artillery in this hex uh, so that if it were to be close combated by the by the uh, by by Stuart's division um, it would get that artillery bonus which would make it uh, a lot less likely that it would have to retreat as a result of close combat. Um, and I am able to do that, and I am able to move one strength point of artillery here, and the reason why is, uh, it's a little hard to see now, now they've got units covering up, but there's woods, less than 50% of this hex is taken up by wood, by this wood symbol, so that means that for movement and uh, for movement purposes, this is a clear hex, not a movement hex, and um, and I uh, and and the artillery detachment will have just enough movement points to re relocate and um, and and re unlimber to put itself back in firing position. So it will limber for three, spend one movement point to move into the clear hex and then three more points to unlimber and then it, it can adjust its facing as it wants to for free. Uh, so I will do that now. Oops. So I'm just gonna rather I'm not gonna go through all the, the motions of doing that. I'm just going to put it here. Um, and then, oops, put it on the bottom. Um, then I'm going to take my, find a, a point marker, and I want it to be a one, and I'm going to put that underneath it to indicate that there's just, whoops, to indicate that there's just one strength point of artillery here. Um, and then I have to go here and change this, decrease this one down to a one. So now I, I have one point of artillery in each of these two hexes. Now I'm going to adjust my facing of, since I'm moving this, I, I, I'm essentially moving this, this, this counts as movement. Um, so, so now I have to make a decision about how I'm going to face Beatty's brigade, and there is a small. In um, I think one's initial. Oops. Thought would be just to face it directly this way, but that would lead us leave a slight chance of this brigade being outflanked because notice that Clayton's brigade here in its upcoming turn could potentially go to, it can't go here, uh, well actually it would it would be able to go here because uh, because Van Cleef's division or uh, Dick's brigade won't be here any longer. Um, Um, let me just think for a second. Well, that ultimately doesn't really matter. Um, it's still, there's still a possibility that Clayton's brigade could go, it, well, it could go two, that would be allowed, and then four, because that would be allowed because I'm moving outside of any Union zone of control, and then six to move back here. Um, so, and then, then if it were to attack into this hex, that would be a flank attack. Now, the thing about that is that Stewart's division would be expected to maintain command radius, too. So, if I bring Clayton's brigade all the way down here, I'm going to have to bring these other two brigades back in this direction as well to maintain command radius. Um, and... Uh, now the so and which in a sense is would not be a terrible thing because again then I'm getting Stewart's brigade off the Lafayette Road you know back east of the Lafayette Road where which is you know where I much prefer much rather have them be um, now I could have the facing 
this way, leaving no possibility really of uh, Beatty's brigade being flanked. But then if the Union were able to close com successfully close combat in here, then it would have a flank shot here. So um, um, I do have artillery here, so I think I am going to leave it like leave the facing like this and, and have this uh, this extension of Beatty's brigade facing, you know, in the same direction uh, um, as the the mother counter, so to speak. Um, because then what I'm going to do for Van Cleve is I'm going to move Van Cleve and, of course, Dick's brigade here and then here to take up a position here. Um, so the first thing we'll need to do is we'll need to unlimber this artillery in a zone of control, which requires a, a roll on the gun table. Uh, so we're rolling a 1d6, so we'll focus on the blue die here. Rolled a 1, it did it. Wow, zero point gun points lost. Um, so, so we'll flip him, he's limbered, uh, and then he will go back one. Remember, this is a clear hex, so it just one takes one movement point. We'll take that along. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, uh, you're allowed to do this kind of willy-nilly, is I'm just going to consolidate the two detachments into one. So, so I'll actually delete this one, delete this one, go into the stack here, and flip this to increase this to a two. So that worked out real well for the union. Um, and then Van Cleve and Dick are going to move one. Well, we should do it one at a time, so um, it doesn't, the order won't really matter here. So we'll move the division here, or the, the brigade, I mean. So that's one, and then two, three for the forest, plus the stream. Uh, brigades in line, these, these are in line, do pay to cross the stream, so that's four and the shaken marker will go along with them. Um, Van Cleve will spend one, two, three to move. Well, let's get his facing the way we want it here first. So I think we'll want to face, have the facing go like this. And then Van Cle well, Van Cleve can move. Van Cleve is required to stack with one of the brigades in his division. Um, I'm actually going to stack Van Cleve in this extended, which it, which which is allowed. So um, so that will easily put both of these brigades, you know, within Van Cleve's command radius. Um, then for Barnes's brigade, I'm going to move Barnes's brigade, you know, leaving the artillery here for a moment. I'm going to go one half, one, one and a half, two, and place them here because, uh, let's see, that is a wood woods hex board. There's more than 50% of the forest symbol you know, covers the hex, so that's that's a forest. Uh, but but now uh, Barnes is in command radius of Van Cleve because it would take an, an A2-4 uh, leader movement points to move there. So, and the disorganized marker will follow him, and the low ammo, ammo marker will follow him. Um, now the artillery I want to put here uh, and they're already limbered. 
um, they're on their limbered side so I can move so I've got seven movement points so I've, I can move one then I think this is three yeah it's three for limbered artillery to move into a woods hex so that's four and then I can unlimber for three more that's seven so flip him back change his facing and then I'll put him at the bottom of the counter I mean of the stack and then I'll take the strength marker and put it at the bottom of the stack all right and then I'll leave the shaken marker on top just to just to well um, in this series artillery units don't have morale morale temporary conditions like shaken or disorganize and stuff so there really isn't any ambiguity just so um, so I'm gonna put the brigade counter back on the top all right so I've established my line on these three hexes all of them have at least one strength point of, of artillery in them uh, so that um, that will make them resilient against close combat and uh, I've got all three of, of Van Cleef's brigades within a command radius of the Van Cleef counter. Uh, so that finishes my movement for Van Cleef's division and that's really the only move, well except for Wilder's brigade, it's really the only movement I'm allowed at this point because all the other commands are either awaiting an order or in some form of delay status. Um, and I'm not going to move uh, Wilder's Brigade at this point. So going back to our sequence of play, ammo resupply. Um, I could try to resupply his ammo. I think I'll do that. This this video's gone long, so I think I'll probably kind of do a makeup for, uh, make that up in a in a subsequent video. Um uh there's no uh uh oh fire com we have to we should do fire combat because there is some fire combat we can do. Um namely up here. Um so who, first of all, who has line of sight to who up here? Uh, these are all clear hexes here. So, um, and in this series of games, when you're tracing line of sight along a hex side and one, uh, one hex has blocking uh, 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 terrain and the other one doesn't, you... Uh, line of sight does exist and it's not true in all games but it is in this one so I think here each so this has line of sight to this so so Brown uh, sorry so Bate and Clayton both have line of sight to Beatty um, there's no line of sight between Brown and Beatty because this unit blocks it. Um, there's line of sight between to here, to here, you know, from here to here, and not from here to here. And then there's line of sight from here to here, I want to say here to here and here to here so this is very complicated um, so essentially uh, each side has to starting with the the non-phasing side the the confederate side has to decide how they want to uh, do their fire combat um, I think I think I'll just do one one on each. 
Uh, so we'll go. F we'll have fire from here to here, fire from here to here, and fire from here to here. That that way we're making three morale checks on the the, the union side, um, and maybe we can force get a well a, a retreat result would be we'll see a retreat result would be very unlikely i guess because of the artillery um so the case could be made for maybe concentrating fire on one of the two flanks um yeah i think we'll do that i'm changing my mind here we're going to concentrate well you know let's see um what do I, as now thinking as the Confederate player, want to do the next turn? It's hard to make a decision. You know what, just to keep things simple, I'm just going to do one-on-one -on -one firing uh, on each one. So we'll do three uh, fire combats at range. This will be range two, this will be range two, this will be range three here. And we'll do the same going in the other direction. Um, well, actually, Actually, as the Union player, I'm going to want to concentrate my fire on this brigade because this is the A, the the brigade with A-level morale, um, and so this is the one I'd like to damage the most if I possibly can. Um, so, with that in mind, do I want to try to do the something similar for the uh, for the con in the initial Confederate fire? Um, where can I let's see? I'm just trying to think how I can load up on the. Uh, it's gonna. I can't get a three on one. On the on any Union brigade. Um, in the in the next turn. Um, I think for the Union we will. Or, sorry for the the Confederate side. We will just do the the fire already outlined. So first we'll do fire from here to here so this is oops and then I needed to do one thing here I need to get rid of this this marker here because this this unit is now at a level instead of a B level so let's see so this unit's uh, permanent morale state is a B so it's we're firing a B level uh, with uh, a level fire so a level at range 2 is two points so we're rolling on this table here so we'll roll this so we rolled a 10, so that's one, one loss. Uh, the rounding die is irrelevant, and a straggler roll a 5 on B morale. Oops. So we're on this chart here, B5 is a 1. So one permanent loss and one straggler for Beatty. Now, let's see, this brigade here, oh, we didn't do the morale yet, sorry. And we rolled a 26 on the morale, that's that's pretty sure that's going to be no result on a B. Yeah, so we're right here, so no effect. Um, so this has A fire level. Oh, um, the extended uh, marker here has the same morale level as the 
parent unit. Uh, so the, so we're also, when we check morale, we'll be on the B side. Um, so it's going to be two points again. So we're on this column again. Rolled a seven this time. So it's a half, but the rounding die says round up, so we round up to a one. So that's one permanent loss, and I believe there won't be any stragglers, but we'll check. Uh, so B a four. Oh, there is a one straggler. So again, one loss and one straggler for Dick's Brigade as well. And then nothing on the morale. So, one loss. Oh no, not for, that's still Beatty, okay. So the way we do this is we, I'm going to move the straggler here. You always leave the straggler on the right side, so we'll put our loss here. And then a second straggler here, which takes Beatty down below AB level which means that I either have to collapse these units back into here, but, but not the artillery. I'd have to leave the artillery <coughs> there, or I'd have to reduce the parent unit to B fire level, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to put a B counter here. which will play a role in the subsequent fire. Just putting him back on top. So we've done the losses for Beatty. Now here's a, a Dick right here. So, oh, but we can't fire on Dick because there's a maximum, for, for fire combat, there's a maximum range of two. Yeah, so so there's, there is no fire into Dick's brigade here. Um, so now, um, so basically, uh, Brown's brigade is just not in a position to get a shot on any of these Union brigades here, either due to distance or, well, yeah, due to distance uh, and, you know, blockage as well. Um, so now uh, what we'll do here is I think, I think the Union side will concentrate all of its fire on Bates's brigade here. So that's a total of B level, B level, and A level. So that's, and two Bs make an A, so that's two As, and uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, strength of artillery. So this is going to be a, a strong attack here. Um, I as a union, you know, thinking from the perspective of the union player, I really like my decision here, uh, how I decided to do this. Or remembering, of course, that I had to make a judgment call that it was consistent with my rules to defend this road. If I would made a different decision about whether it was consistent with my rules, then I would not have been able to, uh, to do this. Um, so going back to our fire combat information. So the fire points are going to be two A's at range two. So that's four. And then for artillery, we're five points of artillery at range two to three. So that's four plus three is seven fire, fire combat points. So we're on the seven column here. And so we'll roll our combat dice. Um, oh, maybe this is a good opportunity for me to say in the Civil War Brigade series, um, if you're if multiple units are firing on the same target, then you must combine their fire into one attack. You're not allowed to treat this as three separate uh, attacks. The idea being that um, you know that that this unit only has to make one morale roll, not does it have to make 
three morale rolls and have three potential opportunities to retreat. It's just, you know, so you 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 combine all the strength points into one attack, and there's and this unit makes one morale roll to see whether they uh, have to retreat or not. So we're on this seven to eight column here. Um, rolled an eight on this, so that's one and a half. We're here, we're rounding down, so that half becomes a one. Straggler is two, that's not going to be anything, uh, just to confirm this, but bait, I'm pretty sure is, yeah, that's the A. Uh, so A morale, uh, let's see our initial rolls here, so A morale with a two is no stragglers. Um, and then the morale low roll is very low. Um, so a level morale falls in the no effect column. So, uh, so uh, bait has got lucky here. Just one permanent loss that we have to mark for bait. So again, we move the straggler that's already here to the right, and then. Uh, put our permanent loss here. So, um, but even one is taking, you know, our best brigade in Stewart's division. Um, only four more losses, and Bates' uh, brigade will be wrecked, which will prevent it, you know, despite its high morale, from uh, engaging in any close combats and uh, and also make it uh, a lot less resilient to uh, surviving retreat rolls, the uh, you know morale rolls than than it is currently. So that's our fire combat, both for the non-phasing player and then for the phasing player. Um, I'm going to have to remember to do this low ammo bit here in a, in a later video. Um, um, and that's all the fire combat that's allowable here. No one is in range of each other anywhere else on the field. So going back to our sequence of play, uh, so we're done with the fire combat phase. Now we're in the rally phase, and here I'm not again, I'm not going to read the rally rules, um, but here I am allowed to uh, reduce this disorganized to a shaken here, uh, and then. There's a sh let's see any shaken markers here can come off as well so there is one here so we'll remove that um, and that's it So we're finished with rally. There's no stragglers to recover. So, uh, so we're done with the union phase of the 1500 turn. So uh, the next video will do the the Confederate phase of the 1530 turn. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.